How do we find the peristernal window? Well, the patient is in a left lateral position. We try to bring him over as far as possible. Then we take the transducer and we have the thumb on the marker. And the marker is oriented towards the right shoulder. And then uh, we put the transducer on the chest and try to be as close as possible to the sternum. And then we just move downwards from one intercostal space to the next. And then we immediately see where the window is. Important to know that the peristernal window does not work in all patients, but usually you get image quality, I would say, probably in the two-thirds of patients. Always bring the patient in a very lateral position and try to stay as close to the sternum with your transducer as possible. The first view that we can get from the peristernal window is the peristernal long axis. What will we see? We will see a view that cuts the heart in a longitudinal direction and thereby we get a view where we have the left ventricle visible, the right ventricle, the aorta, the left atrium, the posterior mitral valve leaflet and the anterior mitral valve leaflet as well as the aortic valve. So this is cranial, the aorta here, and this is caudal, the apex here. The peristernal short axis is in a 90 degree orientation <clears throat> to the long axis. So if you remember how we had the long axis, the marker was pointing towards the right shoulder. Now what we have to do is we have to rotate the transducer clockwise until we are perpendicular to the original plane. Now the marker, which is here where my finger is, is pointing towards the left shoulder or armpit actually. We can cut the short axis at different levels. This would be the level of the basis of the heart where we can see the aortic valve. We can see, this is the aortic valve, we can see the left atrium, in this case with the left atrial appendage. The interatrial septum the right atrium, the tricuspid valve, the right ventricle, and the right ventricular outflow tract with a pulmonic valve. We can also see certain details. For example, here, it is possible to even see the origin of the right coronary artery. The left coronary artery is more difficult to visualize in a short axis view. It would be somewhere down here. The four-chamber view is probably one of the most uh, important views in echocardiography. First of all, it's um, a view where we see very many structures, and then it's also a view from which we can find all the other structures more easily. <clears throat> so I'll show you how to uh, orient the view, and then also which details you can depict. The four-chamber view should be oriented in such a way that the septum is parallel to the ultrasonic beam. It is furthermore important to really check that the atria are as large as possible because if you're down like this, then you don't have an optimal four-chamber view. So you have to tilt until you really get large atrias. And if you do so, you can see the following structures. We have the lateral wall of the left ventricle. We have the septum. We have the right ventricle with a moderator band. We have the lateral wall of the right ventricle. Then we have the left atrium, the right atrium, the interatrial septum with the fossa valis. We have the tricuspid valve with the septal leaflet, and here the mitral valve with the anterior leaflet, the posterior leaflet. If we want to go into more details, we can even see the pulmonic valves as they enter the left atrium. This is the right upper pulmonic uh, um, vein, not valve, of course the right pulmonic vein. Those are the left pulmonic veins, the lower and the upper. 
And here you would see the descending aorta, the orthogonally uh, cut it, or orthogonally uh, uh, visualized descending aorta. The diameter of the left ventricle has traditionally been measured using M-mode from a parasternal approach. But you can also measure diameters using the four-chamber view, for example. The following demos will now show you how to measure diameters of the left ventricle. To perform an M-mode measurement of the left ventricle, you need a parasternal long or short axis view. You can actually do it from both. I will show you how to do it from the short axis. So the first thing you have to look into is if the ventricle is really round. This is important uh, for the reasons already mentioned. So once you have a nice view of the left ventricle, you will put the M mode exactly through the middle of the left ventricle and optimize the image so that you have a very good contour and then freeze the image and perform the measurement of the septum at diastole. So we have the biggest width of the left ventricle shortly before the QRS complex starts. So this is where you would start with your M-mode measurement of the septum. Then you would measure the end diastolic diameter, the posterior wall, now all these measurements are diastole, and you would then perform the same measurements at systole for the end systolic diameter, for the posterior lateral wall, and uh, these are the, the measurements basically that you would perform. Be careful when you perform M-mode measurements of the left ventricle. It is very important that you get a perpendicular orientation of the M-mode beam to the walls of the left ventricle. If you don't get that, you might have a diameter which is too large where you overestimate the size of the left ventricle. But let's now see which parameters are available for the quantification of left ventricular function. Fractional shortening, eyeballing and estimation of left ventricular function, calculations of ejection fraction using the Simpson method, calculations of stroke volume cardiac output and take a look at fractional shortening. Ejection fraction with echocardiography. Everything that is above 55% is normal. Just to review, you need two things. First of all, the LVOT diameter with which you can calculate the cross-sectional area and then you multiply the cross-sectional area with the time velocity curve that you get with the post-wave Doppler. In the normal patient, we have almost complete opening where the cusps almost touch the aortic root, while this is not the case here. To quantify aortic stenosis with CV Doppler, I would start from the apical approach. And I would try to get an apical five chamber view and place the continuous wave Doppler spectrum right inside the valve. Now, it's very important to also put the focus point exactly where the valve is. Now you can see the spectrum here is not very good. So you can optimize the signal by moving your transducer further lateral and then you have a much better angle to the ultrasound beam and you are really parallel. And this way you will usually get much higher gradients than if you use the classical five chamber view. In this case you also get a much better spectrum. So from this position, I would then wait to see if I get a beat which is high, and then I could measure the gradients. Also very important to see that you get the LVOT within the curve. First of all, 
This gives you information if you really have the signal of the aortic valve. And second of all, it's usually a sign that you are in an optimal position with your Doppler spectrum. So once you have such a signal, all you need to do is take the cursor, put it at the tip of this curve, thereby measure the maximum velocity, which in this case is 5 meters per second, and the machine will automatically calculate the maximal gradient by applying the Bernoulli equation. But you can also do it in your head. You already know why I'm showing you this to quantify mitral regurgitation. Obviously, the size of the jet plays a role. Here are four different examples which show four different degrees of mitral regurgitation. Here on the top left is just a very little flame, a blue flame. Obviously, it has to be blue because mitral regurgitation flows towards the left atrium, which means it's away from the transducer and therefore blue. But the jet is very small. In this case, the jet is a bit larger and even larger here and very, very large here. Also note that there's a lot of mosaic colors in here, so the velocity is fairly high, which is typical for mitral regurgitation. primary disease and we will always carefully look for atrial septal defects. If, um, hint to uh, think of an ASD can uh, be the elevated flow in the pulmonary artery of atrial septal defect. Another uh, sign uh, frequently seen in patients with significant shunt is that we have a more or less a dilation of the this is an example where we can uh, nicely see the shunt in a short axis view. We see the aorta here, the interaltral septum, and uh, high up in the interaltral septum, we see this rather small. Uh, the subcostal view would uh, actually be ideal for visualization. Of so how would we quantify ASD by just looking at the size of the ASD? As I mentioned before, it does not really give us an idea how much shunt diameter of the pulmonary artery measure with pulsed wave Doppler at the same site here, the velocity time integral and get the pulmonic flow and the ratio between the, uh, both will give us QP, QS, uh, the shunt ratio and as soon as we end up with a shunt ratio of 1.5 or more, we would call this a significant shunt. How about uh, pulmonary artery pressure?
really uh, define the location and uh, define the type of these defects. When we look at the long axis view, when we see a defect uh, close to the order, this can either be the most common form, the perimembranous VSD, and uh, sites. Here are some examples. Short axis view, left ventricular outflow tract close to the aortic valve. Um, we see in the 2D image that there is uh, uh, some aneurysmatic transformation here. And looking at, uh, at the color, we see that there is still a significant uh, uh, shunt here. When we only look at the 2D image, uh, this could also be a spontaneously a closed uh, is. Here again, uh, a trabecular, a muscular VSD seen in the short axis view, a septal defect. 